I just want to say welcome everybody to uh, what I believe is going to be a very exciting hands-on session. Uh, my name is Cedric Clyburn. I am a developer advocate at Red Hat, and I, I've got a lot in store for you today. So we're going to be talking about how to practically integrate generative AI into your applications, uh, working in a cloud-native way, so uh, working with containers, and then taking those containers and, and deploying to a Kubernetes environment. So we're going to have some Python examples. We've got some Java examples. Any Python or Java developers here? Sweet. OK. All right, perfect. So we've got a lot in store for you today. And I'm going to have the source code for the demos I'm doing, slides, resources at the end. So if you want to check out what I did, follow along later, feel free to do so. We're going to be using a lot of different open source tools and technologies to make this generative AI magic work. Um, but I just want to understand you guys real quick. Uh, did you come to this session perhaps because you work with containers or Kubernetes and, and you're interested in that part? Cool. OK, maybe did you come to the session to learn about what open source AI means and how to deploy these models, perhaps? OK, cool. And then how many of us are developers? OK, sweet. I love it. That's what I love about this conference. Any operations, folks? OK, I got some stuff for you guys, too. Um, but with the next 28 minutes, let's go ahead. And I just really want to level set really quickly about what it means to build applications with generative AI, because I'm specifically talking about building, testing, and deploying these applications that are using models to either take a large amount of information in and produce an output, or to work with a prompt uh, and, and, and create new information, new text, new content. Because generative AI is, in the past year, changed so much, right? Since ChatGPT and other popular models have came out, uh, us as developers have had a really exciting opportunity to start using these models as APIs. And we're going to talk about how you realistically do that with Langchain. Um, and a variety of other patterns to create really, really cool, useful uh, enterprise applications, as well as some fun examples that we're going to show with these AI models. Um, but you might have already been using tools like GitHub Copilot, um, like Olama, any other tool to run a model locally so that you can integrate it into your application. And then if you haven't yet, we're going to show how you can do all of that from my system here. And if you're not already working with generative AI, I think uh, we're going to start seeing it even more. Gartner says that 80% of enterprises are going to have some type of generative AI capabilities in their applications. So the big question I have for you is how are you going to learn and apply generative AI into your applications and into your solutions? So this brings me to this kind of slide that I want to show of how do we illustrate the AI journey for an enterprise, but also for us as developers? How do we actually take all of these different steps that we need to think about when working with AI models and simplify this, right? Um, so I kind of want to break down what we're going to be talking about in today's demo specifically, uh, starting from the ideation and prototyping phase, when you have the need to start working with AI in your applications, and you need to start working with uh, uh, the models that you might have from Hugging Face. Uh, right now, there's over 700,000 models that are on that repository. So how do you kind of understand which one is right for your use case? Are you going to be working with text, image, audio, et cetera? How are we going to benchmark these models to see which one uh, might perform better for our specific use case um, and kind of experiment with our data? So we're going to learn about how you can do that locally. But also, the main part I want to kind of talk about is building applications with generative AI. So once we have a model selected, whether it's open source, whether it's hosted with uh, Claude or ChatGPT, how do we actually operation or put this into our application using patterns such as RAG to work with more information to enhance the model? Um, do we work with uh, fine tuning in a, in, a, in a way to specify the model for our use case? Uh, what flows or agents are we going to use for these applications to enhance the capabilities so we're working with a base model, but also uh, specifying it to our use case. And then finally, we'll also take a look at the operationalizing part. So the demo that I'm showing today is going to be going from a local development environment on my computer here to taking that application containerized to a production environment on Kubernetes. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the stack for that too. But how do we think about model serving, not just using Olama locally, but um, working with um, different open source projects to ensure that we have the production-ready capabilities for Kubernetes and for these enterprise applications? How do we access work with tokens? How do we monitor the models and see where they're performing well and where they're performing not? There's a lot of things that we're going to talk about. Um, and the fun part is that as a developer, you don't have to be an expert 
in AI to understand and use these models, right? We're working with these models uh, through APIs, which makes it much easier to get started. Uh, and most developers, as we see, are already using these AI models in these third party um, uh, services. So being able to use LangChain to just call a model, which is amazing. The only issue, if we're working with a hosted model, uh, is that these APIs are costly, right? They're not free. Someone's paying for the, the, their AWS bills, whatever it might be. Um, and there's the issue that you know every token that we're using costs a certain amount, right? So the larger our response is, the bigger our model is, the more our costs are going to be. As a developer, it doesn't really matter to me, but maybe my boss might care a little bit more about it. But the costs keep coming. Not only are we paying for tokens, and we're, hey, <laughs> we're paying for a subscription fee, uh, there's other costs that we need to take into consideration when we're picking out what model we want to use for our application. But the biggest idea is that it all starts with being able to access a model, being able to use a model, and then we'll talk about the production part afterwards. But why would you want to run a model locally? So being able to access a model on my local machine helps in a lot of different ways. As a developer, uh, it's, it's nice to be able to call uh, an API, but if I can do it locally and I don't have to worry about authorization or latency, it's a much bigger advantage to quickly iterating and building on my application. And for, my, for uh, a business use case, your, your data is essentially your biggest asset. Uh, and there's a lot of restrictions that they talked about in the keynote. Uh, for where your data can be, especially in the EU. It's a little bit different. Um, but we want to be able to control and have our confidential data secure. Uh, local models allow for that. So all of these open source models allow us to keep our information secure, but also to set up this easy customization for working with a model temperature, top K, whatever it might be. So I want to start off the demo by showing a really cool extension. And in my opinion, I believe it's the most comprehensive way to start working with AI as a developer on my local machine. And it's called Podman AI Lab. Has it, have any of us heard of Podman the container engine? All right, I love you guys. So Podman recently, uh, in, in conjunction with the Podman desktop team, released an extension. And this is a completely free to use open source tool for working with generative AI to get set up with different use cases, learn best practices, be able to work with models from Hugging Face, uh, work with them as services so I can just easily integrate them into my application with a local host, uh, define the port, and call, um, call the model, and playground environments to test things out. Without further ado, are we excited for a demo? Woo! All right, so let's get it started. So this is kind of the first step as a developer for me to get started with generative AI. And as I mentioned before, this comes from the Podman container engine and the Podman desktop project. If you go to podman-desktop.io, you can learn how to uh, easily install this for Mac, Windows, Linux, uh, and, and get started working with not only containers, um, but generative AI. So I'm going to hop back over here to um, Podman AI. And so in the, it's an extension as a part of Podman Desktop. You can also work with images, containers, pods, Kubernetes, which is really neat. Um, but specifically, Podman AI Lab allows me to work with my containerized applications for AI apps the same way I would do on a production environment. So all within containers, I can work with them in pods. And let's go ahead and see that here. So there's a variety of different recipes. And these are kind of like starter applications to show me if I don't have any experience with technologies like LangChain or whatever it might be to work with AI, how I can easily get started. Um, and so the first one I'm going to quickly show is the most basic application. It's a chatbot. But what Podman Desktop AI Lab provides is kind of this boilerplate starter code and the ability to quickly start up this application. So it's going to clone it to my local directory. I can specify which model that I want to use. So how many of us has used Mistral before? Sweet. OK, so Mistral is a, a nice open source model, just like Llama. Um, but there's a variety of different models that you could use and import into Podman Desktop, and I'll show that here in a second, to use on your local machine and start an inference server. So I'm going to go ahead and start this here. And what it's going to do is clone a repository with source code uh, that's using um, uh, uh, Streamlit as a UI. We're going to be working with LangChain. Uh, and this builds the containers. So this builds a Streamlit uh, Python application, so I can inference my actual uh, model. And Llama C++, which is an inference server, uh, to be able to mount this um, Mistral model to the container so that I can start making calls to this model locally. 
Uh, and let's go ahead and check this out. So it's running as a pod, so one or more containers and one uh, isolated unit. I can see the uh, information about the logs, but I'll go ahead and open this uh, in my local browser so I can show you what we're going to do in today's demo, and I'll give you a little teaser, is we're going to turn this into an enterprise application by um, adding some RAG capabilities to it. So ingesting our private data, ingesting uh, information about our company, our documentation, so that it can help people, help internally, uh, or we could uh, open it up to the public. So what's happening here is we've got a simple application here, and I'll show you the source code at the same time. Uh, if I go back to this recipes catalog, and I'll go ahead and ask, um, why is the sky blue? So I'll go ahead and ask the model uh, a question here through the container that's being ran. And I'll go ahead and show you that at the same time, I can open up the source code here. Um, and I'll open this up here and show that we have um, essentially a, a super simple Python application. I'll make this a little bit bigger. And I'll walk you through the steps. This is a really nice starter place for getting started with AI applications, where I can see that I'm connecting to the model that's running locally on port 8001, uh, making a call with the OpenAI compatible API, um, and essentially determining if I have Llama C++ as an inference server, or um, using OLama as an abstraction on top of that. Um, checking to uh, have state control, uh, title, uh, making the call, um, a prompt template, so giving the uh, model you know, uh, uh, a, t a type of context for the conversation I'm about to have, and storing the chat. So this is a super simple example. Uh, a funny one that I kind of want to show real quick is the uh, object detection. So we're using a different model here. We were using Mistral before. Um, this is going to be using a uh, Facebook uh, open source model to identify different objects. So I can start this one up as well. So it checks out the repository on my local machine. Um, spins up uh, these containers, uh, one for an inference server and one for a front end. Uh, and so now if I check out this one, I've got some different examples of images that I want to show real quick. Uh, for this first one, this is me at the booth hanging out. You should visit us. We're right over there. Um, so OK, it looks like we have an error. Let's do some live debugging. Um, looks like it's trying to connect on port 8000, but maybe the model is on port 8001. That might be the issue. Uh, let me check real quick and see what might be going on here. This is a great use case for me to be able to open up the logs for this specific application. So we've got this object detection, uh, and we can see specifically what's happening here is that we might have a uh, model that's being hosted on a different port than what the actual application is uh, looking for. So this brings me to uh, not being able to show you this specific example, but to the services. So if you've worked with um, different model serving tools locally, you know that it's very easy to spin up a service based on a specific um, model and define that port. So we can easily set up this inference server just as we were doing with the chatbot uh, on a specific port. And here we have starter plate, uh, boilerplate code for working uh, with a variety of different languages. So I could be a Java developer, and if I want to use Quarkus's Langchain for J, I have all the starter boilerplate code that I need to get AI integrated with my application, right? The model's being served, but we also have starter plate code in order to uh, create a service to uh, make requests to that model. And it's that easy to get started in a variety of different languages. So I'm going to go ahead and show this here. So I've got, um, if I open up a different project here, uh, let's see. So I've got a quick um, Java example that I want to show you. How many Java developers we have here? OK, cool. Anyone used Quarkus before? Awesome. Sweet. So um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm CD'd into my directory here. I'm going to do a Quarkus dev. Essentially, what I have here is an example of an insurance application. So we can see different user claims. Uh, but we also have Langchain as a dependency. So we can easily connect this application or this model, sorry, based on the port uh, that we're assigning. Or if we want to connect to ChatGPT, we could do that with a bearer token and the authentication there. So it has a front end that I'm going to show you really quickly once this is compiled. So it looks like um, we've got an application running on localhost port 8005. If I open this up, we've got an example of an application we're working on. What I've done, and you can see this here, is added the ability for a chatbot. So this is done with a WebSocket. Uh, this is kind of simple to set up uh, in this specific use case because I'm using a dependency like Langchain for J. Uh, that allows me to essentially just create a simple WebSocket to chat with the application. 
Um, so what we can do in a specific use case like this is ask it a question about this specific claim. So we've got information already summarized with the model about the date and time, the sentiment of the customer. I'm going to ask, uh, provide me the contact details for the customer. And what we can do is ask the model a question like this. If, uh, if I had pasted the correct port for this model, so let me go ahead and um, refresh this and try again. So uh, now that I've connected to the actual port for the model, uh, let me ask a question. Uh, contact details for customers. And what's great is using AI like this in natural language to make a call to the model. So I'll show you what just happened as I made that claim is that we provided the context of the actual application, uh, of the actual, sorry, claim that we have from the application. So uh, we have a claim summary. All that data that you already saw that was extracted, uh, we can see here, as, long, uh, as well as a uh, system prompt so that it can help us and actually determine what's going on. So we have our response back in tokens, but we can see that it went through the information we have, uh, provided all the information, and this can really help with different use cases of how do we save our customers' time and how do we save our employees' time. So you can use different frameworks like that, but in the interest of time, um, I've kind of talked a little bit about Podman AI Lab. There's a whole session about it later on today where you can learn about playground environments, how you can import models such as GGUF quantized formats from Hugging Face, um, and the different recipes. Let me head back over to um, the next step, which is how do we take a chatbot like the one we just had and expand capabilities to it, right? Because it knows that the sky is blue, but it doesn't know uh, different information about my company, about my specific use case. Um, because let's be frank, I mean, data is one of our most important assets. That's why a lot of people end up using ChatGPT or Perplexity to answer their day-to-day -day questions, because we can use these models in order to work with so much data that a regular person couldn't. I'm talking about things in our enterprise, such as technical docs, Q&A, support, forms, financial documents so much more that it would be impossible for a regular human to be able to understand all this information. So what we're going to do is apply RAG to our application. RAG is a pattern that allows us to prompt engineer, which it's a cool title. I would like that. Um, but we can essentially take more information from a database. This is a vector database, so we can sort documents by similarity score. We could also use a SQL database, whatever it might be, to ingest those documents initially, right? So it could be documentation, could be financial documents, whatever it might be. Add that to the prompt and then get that response back that is augmented by the LLM to provide information about my company, my information, my people. Uh, and it's a really, really neat pattern because it's very cost effective. We can use a base foundation model like Llama or Mistral as we're about to do. And we're going to show this in action. So I'm going to have to speed through this as uh, I kind of talked too long about Podman AI Lab. Um, but I love it, so it's OK. And I showed the beginning where we were working with Podman AI Lab as a developer. But what does it mean to move it into production? Because we're going to show using OpenShift AI, which is a collection of open source projects for AI, to deploy our chat app. Now we're going to add. Um, uh, capabilities for RAG, uh, working with Elasticsearch as a database and importing a model just as we were doing with our local development environment. So I want to quickly talk about what it means for the path to production. It's fun to work with this on my local machine, but when we actually go and deploy these applications to production environments, we're thinking about not just this fun part down here, but we're thinking about how are we working with different streams of data, logs, information, and how are we storing this and, and ingesting this so that we can build models, we can update vector databases, we can build out RAG pipelines to then deploy those models or deploy those applications and kind of have this whole MLOps flow of deploying uh, AI-enabled applications, but with all the uh, enterprise features and production features that we need for our actual applications. And we kind of showed this before, but it's not just the containers and the Python code that we have to think about. We have to think about the machine learning libraries, the IDEs that we might be using or our data scientists might be using, how we can work with large amounts of data for RAG pipeline, like tools like Ray or Airflow or Spark, uh, experimentation and how we can actually run these on a Kubernetes cluster with tools like Kubeflow and MLflow and serve the models with KServe. At the other side, right, all of this is Linux processes. So we need to think about acceleration, Think about uh, Linux to run these processes. I'm on a Mac, but these containers inherently are Linux containers. 
Uh, am I using a, a container engine like Podman or Docker? How are we orchestrating these containerized applications in a way that we can scale, right? Not just one application on my local machine, but thousands of different microservices that are all working together uh, to make really cool applications work. Um, we also think about how we can visualize and understand the performance of our applications and models, how we automate the software delivery with Tekton and Argo, um, and think about software defined storage. Where do our, where's our data lie? Um, we need to have it locally on premise or can we have it somewhere else at integration? So it's a whole big stack and I know it seems a little bit overwhelming but what's really nice is uh, how many of us know about Fedora for Linux? Cool. So Fedora, you know, I, I haven't used it too much but I understand that what Red Hat has done is taken a variety of open source projects and this has been going on for 20, 30 years and essentially supported them and productized them into one single distribution. And what we've done is taken all the tools that you need for uh, an application and an AI-enabled platform into one distribution. And now you have a way in a supported way, and this is an open source project as well, uh, called Open Data Hub, to uh, run these AI workloads on top of Kubernetes. So we're going to show this in action here, the uh, ability to essentially set up a super basic RAG pipeline to serve a model. We're going to be serving the same exact model that we had on Hugging Face um, and uh, work with collaboration and, and import other users, but also uh, ensure that we have life cycle for this application. So without further ado, I think it's time for the second demo. Uh, and I'm really excited to show you uh, the second phase, right? We were working with these local applications in containers, in pods. Uh, but what does it mean to actually work with this in a production environment? So, uh, here is uh, what I was talking about as OpenShift AI. So it's a collection of these different open source projects that you probably heard about. So KServe, uh, support for Jupyter Hub, for different uh, libraries like PyTorch. Um, and I've set up this project so that we have um, the ability to kind of uh, start off by importing objects into a vector database. So we have it running as a, uh, Elasticsearch as an operator on top of Kubernetes. And I'm not a data scientist, but I'm going to quickly kind of break down how this happens for ingesting our confidential and, and, and uh, company data. So essentially what we've done is set up a connection to Elasticsearch within this Jupyter notebook that's on the cluster. Um, and so we have this connection here. We've verified it. And we're going to import these different um, uh, dependencies in order to break up our data into chunks so that the model can ingest it. Uh, a popular one is Pi PDF, but there's a variety of other ways that you can set up a RAG pipeline and kind of ingest this documentation. We've got a lot of documents that we're going to be using, uh, and these are actually publicly accessible, nothing private going on here. Um, and so we can see that we have a lot of different documentation about OpenShift AI. So this is all in the form of PDFs. Your data could be something different. What we're doing is essentially going to chunk them and split them up into different pieces and also include references to the website so that when I ask the chatbot, um, for example, uh, this same one information, it's now going to have the information from my enterprise data. Uh, so we can do this in, um, in this specific uh, RAG pipeline that I'm setting up, but we would want to automate this, right, theoretically. Uh, what we're going to do is split documents. We're going to uh, create an index in our vector database. We're going to use Hugging Face Embeddings so that we can understand the similarity between different documents and sort that later. Uh, and we're going to create a, this huge array with all of the documents that we've adjusted, all of these PDFs, to finally be able to search with a similarity score uh, natural language. So my query here is how can I work with GPU and Tainstone and OpenShift AI? Uh, we're doing a search for a similarity score and we have all of the information down here. Uh, of course, this isn't formatted well, uh, but related to our search. And when we pass that to the model, it's going to be able to understand, okay, what is relevant for this specific situation and pass that back to me in the form of this chatbot, uh, but now in a production sense. So I'll go ahead and show you really quickly what it means to now that we have an, a vector database, and now that we have, um, I'll show you the, the model that we've uploaded. So um, we have Minio here as an object store. I've gone ahead and uploaded a Mistral 7B quantized uh, format uh, model here in the, um, in the bucket so that we can access that from OpenShift AI. And so it uses um, a variety of different runtimes. So I could use VLLM, I could use Llama C++, OpenVINO, whatever it might be. Uh, to essentially create an endpoint for us to be able to invoke. And I could take this and open up my terminal, do a curl, or I could add authentication to it, whatever we want to do. But we have a model running just as we would in a local environment. But now, uh, with 
um, the ability to have serverless functions. So if we have more requests, uh, the, the environment is going to scale up. And it's very helpful for these production applications. Um, I want to quickly talk about what it means to um, update my code for this functionality. So um, this is the same chatbot that we were using before. So we were connecting to a model endpoint. Um, I want to show you what it means to add very briefly the capabilities for um, being able to work with RAG. So the first thing, and I'm just going to have to paste this over because it's a lot of code, is that I want to add in some environment variables. So the ones I'm going to ask or add are the ability to connect to a model endpoint, the uh, authentication for our, our Elasticsearch, and um, now when we pass that in uh, and we run this container on top of Kubernetes, we're going to pull in the URL, the same one here, and be able to run that. Um, I also want to kind of set up um, uh, an Elasticsearch connection. So I'll go down here and I'll add this um, probably down here to be able to, and I'm going to have to paste this in real quickly, set up a connection with Elasticsearch as a dependency, and I'll have to update my requirements.txt as well. Um, so what we're going to do here is just as we were doing in the notebook, we're going to set up a connection to our Elasticsearch URL with our, our credentials, set up a new embeddings um, so that we can search uh, from this vector database. Uh, we're going to use the same prompt template, um, but now essentially what we can do is we have the prompt functionality right here of, hey, I want you to respond back to my context, but we need to add the capabilities to, hey, I want you to retrieve documents as you understand the context. Um, and so the last part I have to add is the ability to work with those URLs just as we were doing in that uh, um, Jupyter notebook. Um, so what's going on here is that essentially um, we're adding the ability to extract links from the database. We're ad adding the ability to uh, work with the source documents, uh, combine the source text and the link text into our response, uh, and be able to provide that as a response back. So we've kind of enhanced and supercharged essentially the application to have the capabilities to work with a model, whether it's local or remote, to be able to work with an uh, Elasticsearch in, uh, environment, whether it could be running on a local container or in production. Um, and what we could do is just essentially build this as a container and deploy it, right? Uh, it's a simple container file that I have here that I could build, or I could um, uh, essentially use OpenShift to build it for me, whatever I might want to do to deploy it. Um, but what I'm going to also show is that um, I could use what Natalie was doing earlier with that uh, developer hub in order to um, uh, think about all of the different capabilities for operations teams. So I'm not a developer, but I do know coding, and I do know a little bit about deployments on top of Kubernetes. I don't know about CI, I don't know about CI, CD, or um, the different you know, abstractions in Kubernetes. Um, I don't know about all the APIs that exist in my organization, but I could kind of use this platform, and that's what Natalia's next talk is going to be on, to abstract all of this for me as a developer. So I think about my container, I think about my application, I think about my source code. Then I can take this and, and push it uh, as a container or as just source code to somewhere that's going to perform all those checks for, uh, that we need for production environments. But essentially what we've done is, I've already done this in, in advance, and so if I go over to um, my local environment, so let me, or not local environment, but production uh, uh, namespace. So I'm going to show you that I've already set this up. We have the Minio store, we have the model being served um, in a serverless fashion, and um, what we've done is actually push that container here that we had um, to, the, uh, to a repository and added those environment variables. So this is the last part, and then I'll kind of wrap up and, and give you some cool resources and how you can get started or do this same demo. So we have this as an application. You could use a deployment.yaml. We have this pod running. This is the same chat app, but now with those capabilities. It also has the environment variables that I needed in order to connect to this remote model. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and just open this up so we can give it a question about our documentation and see this in real time. So we've added a route to this service, and I'll open up this chat application. Um, I'll give it a quick, uh, quick question here, and, um, and let's see what the response is based on that new information that we have. Um, and fingers crossed the network allows me to do this because really, really cool example. So we've got the new, uh, new um, we're the same chatbot, new functionality, right? Um, what model servers can I use with 
And you'll notice I kind of just abbreviated OpenShift AI. What's great about models is we can use natural text and it's going to understand exactly or, or kind of relatively what we're talking about. So it's going to kind of query that Elasticsearch database. Uh, and I'll kind of move this here so I can kind of break down everything that we've done. We've worked with uh, local containers for working with models and inferencing them. Uh, we've been able to serve them uh, in a local fashion, work with the recipes. Uh, we could import more models locally or to our production cluster. Um, and uh, I'll kind of wait for this real quick, and then we'll kind of wrap up and some cool resources and everything. But this is kind of the flow in how we can go from a local environment with a local stack, but keep that same stack and the same model that we're using to have predictability going from my local development environment here on the right uh, left but, or a uh, production environment here on the right. So we'll give it a two seconds. I didn't give GPU access to the, the model. I, I probably should have done that. But GPUs are expensive, and it's hard times right now. So um, <laughs> we'll just give it two more seconds, and hopefully it's going to be able to retrieve the information. Now, if I had you know, A100, it would be a different story. Um, but um, let's see, two seconds, hopefully. In the meantime, let me just kind of talk about how you can get started, because I've used Podman Desktop here uh, to work with containers, but Podman AI Lab allows you to work with the models, allows you to work with playground environments to test out temperature and top K, um, and also import new models. Um, and I want to point to some other really cool talks that are be going, going to be going on today. So if you like the, the, the uh, platform engineering side, the talk after this is about that. If you like Podman Desktop, we have a whole session about that. If you want to learn about how to model tune and not just use RAG, but enhance the model itself, we've got to talk for that. And for your Java developers, we've got to talk uh, for you as well. Finally, the application gave us a nice response. Um, and so not only are we invoking the model, but we're working with that Elasticsearch database to have similarity score for the documents um, that are relative to our question. And we get the links here and a document with just 200 lines of code. So I want to say thank you so much for your time. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. Here are some resources, the slide links, and uh, a link to get started with OpenShift AI for free, no cost, 30 days, uh, and you can renew the subscription, so unlimited usage of what the tools I just used today were. Thank you very much. My name is Cedric Clyburn. Enjoy the conference.